discussion. I want to welcome back Stephen Scott to the podcast. Uh, we're going to cover a topic today that we we touched on in our last conversation, and it kind of wet, I think, both of our appetites to to dig into it a little bit. Uh, and the, the show that we did previously was uh, the unsolvable training problem of how do you get rigorous enough training to simulate reality without the full dangers of, of reality. And within that discussion, we talked about the Aikido's unsolvable marketing problem of, of its image. And when I say marketing, I'm not talking just about how does it advertise or, or whatnot. It's more of the, what reputation does Aikido have? How does it uh, find its, the people that, that uh, it, it wants to appeal to and to draw them into becoming students and what have you. So uh, welcome back, Stephen, and I'm looking forward to getting into this discussion. Yeah, um, pleasure once again, Tristan, to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, you know, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about since our conversation. It's, it really gave me some good uh, food for thought. And in breaking down, I think there's, there's two basic aspects we're dealing with here. One is the popularity of Aikido, and the second is its, its reputation in terms of being an effective martial art. And I think, um, you know, there have been others that have written articles about the, what they see as the waning uh, popularity of Aikido with uh, dojos getting smaller, uh, the, the body of students getting smaller, um, all the way to things like uh, Google search results, how fewer people are searching for Aikido uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, that metric. And there, there's some others, but um, I think that that's, maybe a good place to start is the, the popularity uh, question. Uh, and we kind of put the, the reputation one off. We'll, we'll discuss that in a little bit. Um, <laughs> I've heard from a number of, of dojos that are, are having issues with their, the body of their students just getting older, younger students mm -hmm. aren't coming in as much. Now, it, it does vary quite a bit region to region. For example, in Japan, from what I understand, Aikido is still very popular. They don't have any problems with popularity waning. Um, but I think throughout the rest of the world, I do perceive uh, an issue with Aikido losing popularity and relevance generally. What, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, I would have to agree, Tristan, because uh, from my own personal perspective I, and from the number of people I know that are in our organisation and, in fact, that are part of the British Aikido board, I know that a lot of clubs have taken a hit, particularly over lockdown, and with them trying to reopen, they're just not going to do it. Uh, a lot of clubs have just closed down completely. Sometimes it's premises that have been closed and they've not, they've not been able to relocate anywhere with the correct numbers of students that they had originally and that on top of you know changes in how people work and why people are working differently now people are working from home quite a lot remote working is now a real thing and people are now no longer willing to travel for something and that's a big part of this now going forward as well is that I love training in Aikido, and I've said this, I also do other martial arts, but I love Aikido because of what it gives me and what I can put into it. And I will happily still travel 10, 15, 20 miles to train, regardless of how long the class lasts, because I have a love for this particular martial art. But I tend to find now that most people are now no longer willing to do that. And I think what we're looking at in the waning aspect of Aikido is a change in market graphic as in who's likely to be going for it, the accessibility of it and the fact that most people want something on hand immediately, uh, then they're, they're, they're not willing to travel for it. So an example of that is I had a club in Glasgow. We were an after work club pre-lockdown, pre-COVID. Now, post-COVID, we have the option to open back up, but about 60% of the students are now no longer willing to travel to the club, despite the fact that most of them will be travelling on average, about one quarter the distance I will in order to get there to run the club, for example. So we've got all these different kind of metas that are happening around the world. And that's just going to add more fuel to the fire for certain things as to why Aikido is not now being as popular. But looking at it in a more historical way, if we can come at it from the kind of pre-COVID era of how things are going to appear, is I can see that there's been a decline of Aikido practitioners over the years. A lot of people retain, as you've just said, their older students, 
And by older, I'm now talking about people who are well into their 40s, into their 50s, you know, and they don't train the same way. They don't have the same youthfulness and vigour. I'm one of them. Uh, the years of abuse from martial arts starts to take its toll. So not only are we an ageing population in Aikido, but new students who come into the class and look are going to see people who are not anymore in the prime of life that they were back in their early 20s, mid 20s, early 30s. So they're seeing older person Aikido being done as well. And even though I train, I still train hard and I still train vigorously as best I can. If they look at what I'm doing now compared to how hard I trained when I was 30 and now I'm nearly 50, it's a completely different thing. And that doesn't bring young people into the class. Now, I think when we look at that, unless they are dedicated to learning something like Aikido and they've done research, uh, what that then leaves us with is people who want to come into Aikido because of either they've read about it and it sounds what they want or it's, it's philosophy of uh, non-contention that's constantly, I'll use the term spewed out across the internet as to how Aikido is for pacifist people and <laughs> we're all very gentle and loving and, you know, we... We, we shower roses and rainbows over people when we throw them and it's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing, but they're missing the point of the martial side of it. Um, that's not going to be attracting too many of the younger generation who are now being brought up in the, the embrace of more hardcore fighting uh, entertainment and those types of styles. And back when I was younger... When you did martial arts, you were an outcast and a strange person, but everyone thought it was something that would be good to do. But in order to do it, you had to travel a tremendous... I mean, I had to travel about 25, 30 miles to go to karate back when I was 14. My father used to drive me uh, up down to Glasgow from where we lived in Ayrshire. And I just don't see people doing that nowadays. So not only is your travel base getting smaller, your catchment area is tightening and you now no longer have the people who would perhaps be willing to go to these classes by hanging about for an hour after work. So all this demographic is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And on the back of that, as you mentioned, we have the, the rising unpopularity of Aikido in terms that what most people see presented online as demonstration Aikido is taken because it's on YouTube. It must be real, right? You know, it's, it's got to be true. Uh, it's taken out of context and the martial aspect and the roots of this martial art are clouded. So people don't consider that. They only see the big demonstrative technique and they fail to see the root of the technique that it comes from. And sometimes even when you look at some of the stuff that's out there that has now been used to negatively advertise Aikido by other persons, which is an entirely different conversation. Uh, when we look at this negative aspect of negative popularity that people are now trying to apply to it, uh, it's very easy to take something that is genuine. For example, someone using a, an exercise in destabilization and core movement and spin that into the fact that this is rubbish, it wouldn't work in the street. Well, of course it wouldn't. It's never been something for working on the streets, but building your core strength and your core stability and core movement. It's not about, if you listen to the video, you'll hear that. But most people just read the title, look at the crazed expression on the front of the video as someone appears to be outraged and buy into the, if I can, I don't want to swear it, but buy into the shit that people are thrown about. <laughs> you, you know, and that is not going to help and hasn't helped for many years now with the negative popularity of Aikido. But I'm also the first person to say there is also a, a lot of rubbish out there. People are putting stuff out there claiming it's genuine Aikido, claiming these are self-defence techniques, claiming this is what they teach in class and it's going to keep you safe, and it won't. It's rubbish. You know, it's, it's really bad technique, it's really bad style, it's really bad form, and it's not anything, really. Mm -hmm. um, but th this is what we're fighting against with this whole kind of negative marketing that Aikido seems to be blanketed with at the moment. And I think that's a great shame because it's very easy to jump on the back of that and throw your comments in, throw your voice in, and not actually understand exactly what it is you're commenting about. Yes, a lot of Aikido won't stand up on the street if you practice it the way you're seeing it in the dojo without applying, like we discussed in the last video, certain methodologies to make it more street effective. 
It's still Aikido, but at the same time, almost every martial art suffers from that, including the ones that claim, excuse me, claim to be street effective. They're still training in a dojo environment. They're still putting videos out there that are training in a dojo environment. I, even, I even honestly can't see the difference. Yeah, it's all yeah. demonstration. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, and as I thought about this, it, it seemed to me like there's three main showcases that a martial art has. The first one being competition. For those arts that have competition, you you see champions emerge. You see the highly skilled practitioners. You get to see what a live confrontation, what a live fight looks like, and who prevails. You get to see the techniques that that tend to win fights, uh, and it's exciting. It's a it's a an entertainment. Um, now then the second one being, uh, we see movie stars and TV action stars where in my opinion, that's really just demonstration Aikido done with a multi-million dollar budget with, you know, really high quality stuntmen, cameramen, you know, directors, lighting, you know, all the stuff that makes a, a demonstration really, really compelling. They can show you exactly what they want to show you. And then you get the third one, which is what you were describing, which was just plain old demonstrations. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think Aikido, maybe on purpose, but maybe a bit accidentally, has got caught in this weird gray zone where it really doesn't do any of those very well. In fact, the third one, I think, is probably the least effective in terms of garnering interest and generating popularity. Uh, particularly in the light of the fact that you don't see, uh, and, and there, it is there, it's just a lot of people don't recognize it, of techniques of, of Aikido being used in competition effectively. Um, mm -hmm. Now, there's a fourth one, I think, that came around with the internet, and that is surveillance videos of actual fights and real mm -hmm. violence. And I think that this has been a it hasn't really been a benefit to Aikido very much because there are very few examples. There are a few, but there are very few of Aikido techniques or Aikidoka that have been effectively used uh, their Aikido in a real setting. And uh, I know uh, Remy Helgeson has got, uh, mm -hmm. a few, he's got, <clears throat> there's some videos of him actually in doing his job as a nightclub bouncer effectively using the controls it doesn't look as clean and and nice as it does in a normal demonstration but that's how real violence goes um <clears throat> but i think the, the the real benefit of that of those surveillance videos is to see how different violence in real life looks like compared to a sport fight or yeah. a john wick movie or or anything like that they're remarkably different um and i guess this is where i came upon that idea of the unsolvable marketing problem is if you are, if you have an art that is focused on a civilian real world environment, where do you, how do you showcase it? How do you show people without lying to them and creating just a really fancy commercial mm -hmm. of what Aikido is capable of? And, and, and I'm not talking even just the techniques alone, although that's, that's a big question mark in many people's minds. Uh, I think that's the easier one to answer than even the strategic <coughs> aspect of Aikido, mm -hmm. uh, the, the creative problem solving that often happens with it. Um, that's the hardest thing to catch on a camera. And, and I think maybe as we are going forward, we're seeing a generation that is been weaned on video. They need to see something on yeah. video to be convinced that it's, that's actually true. And if yeah, there isn't a video completely. of it, it must not exist, which, you know, you and I are old enough to realize how foolish that, that perspective is. I mean, um, you know, we've, we've grown up learning not only from what we see with our own two eyes, but what we've been told by our elders and what, what has been shared with us by people who are much wiser. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a, sh a shame that that's, that's becoming less of a, of, a, of a factor, especially as, like you said, we're having less human contact, less uh, discussions like the ones we're having right now, but face-to-face, yeah. uh, -face, you know, learning from a mentor, um, you know, in the old, older times, you know, a, a young man or a child was going to be getting into a fight and he'd go to his father, his grandfather and say, here's how you handle yourself. I'm going to teach you what I've used effectively to protect myself. And mm -hmm. you'd get mentoring like that, as opposed to going down to your, you know, they didn't have local dojos, <laughs> you know, in yeah. a lot of places. So you just learned from who somebody who knew better or knew better than you did. Um, and, 
And so I think that as we go forward, though, penetrating that problem of the image and the reputation, I think it is going to be a challenge. Now, I don't think it's unsolvable. I think there is a way to do it. Uh, and it starts with, uh, I think, realizing that we as individuals and as a you know community of practitioners of Aikido have to take res- our responsibility. We can't just say it's other people outside that are criticizing us or they're making our, our life hell. I think 95% of Aikido's issues are generated by people within the Aikido community. Like it's a self uh, created problem most, most, uh, most often. Um, and we, we fix ourselves and we will f- fix the rest and not just by getting another movie star or, you know, oh, that, that will drive don't. a lot of that. You know, even if we did like if somebody emerged, it was turned out to be make another movie, you know, basically a, another type of a Steven Seagal or something of that nature. Um, we'd get a flood of people that were knocking on Aikido Dojo's doors and they'd find out within a month or two that, well, they're not teaching me to do that, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I almost wonder if the, the popularity of the John Wick movies had got a lot, a lot of people going into jujitsu gym saying, I want to do what Keanu Reeves did in that movie and then realize, well, r- training doesn't really do that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's grueling and, and it's not, sexy and um you know i think a lot of martial arts suffered from the popularity that came from movie stars making making a wide appeal so um, in fact i think that's a, you could make a great case that the popularity actually damaged the quality of the art because it yes became yeah, it a commercial success and in doing so lost lost its heart um mm-hmm. and what what made it really effective um, yeah. And I think that that's actually leads us into the reputation part of if the quality of an art diminishes, then the reputation becomes tarnished. And, and that's essentially the, the problem that many arts have, have gotten into. Um, I, I count Aikido as, as one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, although I will say in my experience, I've run across some senior practitioners and instructors of other arts that I would ask about this, like, what's your impression of Aikido? And a lot of them have told me this. They said, you know, uh, I didn't know either. I didn't know what to think of it, or I didn't really think much of it. And then I ran across somebody that really knew what they were doing. And it was amazing. Like it, mm-hmm. it's legit. Absolutely. Um, and I had, you know, a couple that say, well, I, I didn't think much of it. And, you know, uh, or, you know, as soon as I ran across somebody that, that showed me what it was about, I knew that, that there was really something to this. Um, but a lot of them will admit, yeah, just like every other martial art, there's instructors that don't know what they're doing. Practitioners don't know what they're doing. Oh, yeah. There's the real deal. You know, there's a, a small portion that are high quality. They know what they're doing. You don't want to tangle with them. You know, uh, what they can do is, is remarkable. Um, and I, I do think it's up to each of us to, to pursue becoming that if we want to be uh, ambassadors of the art. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, one 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 mind at a time is how we change the, the overall perception. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I I agree again completely with what you're saying here, Tristan. Because it's the when we when I look back on the years I've spent studying Aikido, I have and I, I say this quite honestly, I have seen and trained with more pedestrian and lackluster and mediocre instructors than I have exceptional ones. Someone who has been able to make me stand back and think, and I'm, I'm not throwing myself up into the gods here and saying, look how great I am. I'm just saying that someone who makes me step back and go, well, I can actually learn from this person mm-hmm. because I usually find that the opposite applies. One, Sadly for me, the, the dojo I first started out in, we had a really high standard and everything was mixed we also did a little bit of karate, particularly when I appeared, uh, because I was one of the first guys to come in with a karate first time, that other than the original instructor who hadn't trained in it for 20 years, and they wanted me to start doing some strikes and stuff for them and showing them how to punch properly so that they could defend against strikes. Mm-hmm. And that's an ethos that I still bring into my Aikido classes to this day. I teach people to strike because if you aren't taught how to strike, how can you hope to defend Practice defence properly if you can't strike properly or if you can't strike with good intent. It doesn't 
it's common sense. You know, you can't put a shelf up without hole in the wall, roll plugs, screws. You know, yeah. if you just hold it against the wall and leave it go, it's going to fall down. Mm-hmm. And um, but as time went on, and again as Aikido gained popularity and more people came into the dojo. It was a different generation. It was maybe about eight, nine, ten years down the line. And you could see there was a different generational attitude to what people wanted from their training. So when I joined and when I started, it was very hardcore. We want something that's going to keep us safe and we want authentic, disciplined, hard training. We used to train three, four times a week for two or three hours at a time. Mm -hmm. And it was great. And we'd walk away basically unable to move for, you know, a day and a half until the next training session. And then you get in and do it all over again. And then the next generation came in. And I'm not saying that generations get softer as they go. I don't mean it like that. You know, no, back when I were a lad, everything were harder. I don't mean it that way. What I'm saying is that they had different expectations from what they were entitled to have. And they brought with them a sense of entitlement in that... It was almost like the the start of the you get a medal for turning up kind of mm. mentality. That was another 10 years down the line, I think. But we then found people coming in who didn't really like the breakfalls, so they didn't really want to do them. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the senior instructors we were with started to pander to that attitude. So very quickly, within the space of about eight months, we had people who were... Green belts, which was in that old class, it was red, yellow, orange, green, so it would have been their fourth grade up. Uh, I don't use belt colours myself, uh, I just use the grades, but um, they would have been their fourth belt in and most of them couldn't do a forward breakfall, forward the chemi properly. Uh, and they could barely protect themselves with throws, which meant that they didn't like to be thrown which meant that they weren't learning from that symbiotic experience you get taking in the chemi where you find yourself being taken off balance. And as a result, they didn't understand how to take balance. So their ability to do throws was equally really poor. And there was a kind of sped up grading process. And what was happening was, as the art became popular, as you said, more people started to turn up. The classes became slightly more frequent. One of the junior instructors got elevated to Dan grade. He went off and took extra classes but his standards were so far below the rest of the class. He was just looking for people to come in. Extra beer money, if that's the way I want to put it. It was extra beer money for him. And these were his students, so the standards started to drop. So then other people coming in would look at these guys and go, they're green belts. What's that? That's like three from black, four from black. Um, Wow, they're rubbish. This class is rubbish. And then the numbers started to drop. And because they lowered those standards, all because of one incident, one individual, one incident, one attitude, Mm -hmm. over the course of a a 12 to 18 month period, all of a sudden you went from having a group in a class of dedicated, hardworking, you know, strong Aikidoka to effectively Jed Clampett and the Beverly Hillbillies running the show. And it got, it just went, it, it literally became a comedy show. And that's when I started to walk away from it from, with them and go out, go out on my own because I thought, this is not what I want to do. This is not what I want to be associated with. This is not how I train. And that's where I could see the start of the degradation and the attitude towards Aikido. And I agree, it came with the popularity. People wanted to see what they were seeing on screen. So all the core elements went out and the big movements, the big flashy movements came in. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, people are doing suwarawaza, uh, ken movements, and they're doing, um, you know, sword taking techniques from suwarawaza, strangely reminiscent of a certain movie performance that you might have seen in a movie at some point with a certain movie star who shall remain nameless, you know, <laughs> in an off license, if I remember rightly. Um, you know, and we never did find out really why Richie did Bobby Lupo, but that's neither here nor there. No, <laughs> I think you do, but you know what I mean. And it right. all seemed to pander to that type of audience. And then that's what started that kind of deep slide. And that was just locally around one little club in a part of Ayrshire in Scotland. And I'm sure that wasn't just isolated. It happened elsewhere. 
And as a result of that, over the years since then, I've now been in Aikido for 89, 90, I think I started. So it's been over 30 years. I've seen that slide. I've seen the after effects of that seismic slide many years down the line where you suddenly notice someone at a course and it's the student of one of these guys and, you know, by God, they're terrible and they're claiming to be a higher grade than I am. And right. that's what kind of starts it, you know. And so I've, I've seen it firsthand how that type of popularity can suddenly create a change in attitude, a shift in focus away from what the core values of that club were. Ironically, within about a year, none of the core, there were like a core eight students, mm -hmm. none of the core eight students bar one, who was the one that was now the senior instructor, was left in that club. Mm -hmm including myself, every single one of them went away and did something else. Sure. You know, that's something I, I have heard and seen myself, uh, heard from people that have left Aikido because it just wasn't martial enough. Like it was too fluffy uh, to, you know, fill in the blank because it's not like it's ubiquitous. The different dojos have different cultures and mm -hmm. some are soft. They don't want to practice very rigorously or, or what have you. Um, because I, that's what I've noticed about, about a group is if you, you have a certain core group like yours that had a certain martial intensity to it. And as people come in that don't want to participate in that, but they show up anyway, and the groups will start to shift towards mm -hmm. a center. And well, it can shift far enough away that it turns off those people that want to have yeah. that, that martial yeah, training. Yeah, absolutely. Can I also and, just add? Tristan, mm -hmm. it wasn't yeah. just the martial aspect of it. It was the levels of excellence that were held and the respect for the Shodan rank that was held mm -hmm. okay. that, that, that started to slide. So sure. the, the quality also slid to hold on to the ones that were coming in right. because they didn't want to work as hard as everyone else. So effectively, they were pandering to the demands of the client. Do you know what I mean? Right, right. If you look at it that way. You, you know, I you think know. that that's, that's a common problem that martial arts have in, in that. Mm. And this is one of the issues I have with rank just in general, in that I've seen students get frustrated with why am I not testing? Why am I not, you know, at the amount of time I've, I've, I've been at this rank, I should now be testing. I'm not. Why am I not? And whether that's their you know, you can put in the time on the mat, but if you're not actually progressing, then that's, that is an issue. And that's could be an instructor that is not being attentive to a student. It could be a student that's not being attentive to learning in the class. Either way, you don't, the instructor doesn't want to lose the tuition of a student by him getting frustrated and saying, well, if I'm not progressing, then I'm going to quit. And so they mm -hmm. kind of get drawn into that uh, conveyor belt of, rank and and graduations you know testing and and rank promotions because that keeps the attention and that's where the money thing rolls um yeah. you know and it's as an instructor it can be very difficult to have a conversation and say you know i i if you ask why have you not tested it's been you know x number of months now and you think you should be ready i will tell you that you need a little bit of work in this particular area a little bit of work in that area i want to see you test but let's shore these up so that you're ready but I, I think a lot of instructors are not comfortable having that conversation. They mm -hmm. don't want to have to, you know, say it or they, or they forget or they put it off or things like that. Um, again, I think this is a self-generated issue, but I think it is also uh, hinged around that rank. There's a certain amount of, um, what would you say, etiquette, I guess, or mm -hmm. a, a process, an effective method of communicating, all right, why is somebody not testing? Um, you know, and it's, I, I can see there's some use to testing and rank, but for the most part, I think it has just as much bad as there, as it is good, but like in mm -hmm. tool, you know, it can help, it can help draw people along and keep them focused. And that's what I do like about it is when mm -hmm. I tell a student, all right, we're get, I think you're ready to test. Let's prepare you in a month. We're going to do it. Boy, do you see students get cracking they're like oh boy i've got a deadline now i gotta, yeah. I gotta you know I, I really like what that does to the motivation generally mm -hmm. um you know there are a few that don't like testing at all they get all nervous like can we do it next year you know they they, they will get very bashful but um 
it, but it is one of those things that, that there is that upward pressure to the instructors uh, and the, the people who run dojos to keep those tests, you know, going mm -hmm. at a regular clip. And then what do you oh. do if a student's fallen behind, you know, he shows up yeah. twice a month and now he wants to get tested and like, you're not, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. yeah. it's not well, going to be there. I, my workaround of that, Tristan, is uh, I, I don't tell people when they're ready. I ask the students to come to me. You come to me when you want to sit a grade mm -hmm. and the syllabus is there. It's all written down for them. There's the grading. That's the bar. And I warn them up front. That bar is not moving. You have to get to it. You know, so it's, it's just like trying to do chin-ups. You have to get your chin to the bar. You come to me when you want to do it. And if you do it well, you'll pass. If you don't do it well, you're going to fail it. That's it. And then it's uh, what I find is that allows people to just from my own, again, from my own personal perspective, I tried it the other way around and it was kind of frustrating because you could see people who were very talented and very skilled and maybe lacked a little bit of self-confidence. And no matter what I said to them, they were never going to come around. I think you should do your grade now. You, I think you're ready for it. Oh, no, I don't know about that. Um, Whereas I find if, if they come to me and say, look, I want to sit my grade and what do you think? I'll give them an honest answer. And a lot of people don't like it. A lot of people like it because I tell them straight up, oh, thank God for that. You know, I was, I was expecting this chat six months ago, uh, but here we are, we're here, let's do this. And uh, that's how I've always put these forward is that it's, I take the own, and it's not to dodge the responsibility myself. It's, I don't want to be pressuring the students into taking grades. Uh, I don't really charge for grades at all, other than the cost of getting their books updated through the governing agency. Mm -hmm. So it's, it doesn't cost anything to grade. But if, you, you're, if you're not ready, you're going to fail. If you're not ready, I'll tell you you're not ready. And I'll say, I think you should wait and try later. If you insist, you can still sit it. Uh, unless you pull a blinder out the bag, you're going to fail. And then you have to deal with the concept of failure. And I put it back on the student. I try and treat everybody as a responsible adult. Um, ironically, it tends to work better on kids. <laughs> they act more like responsible adults than the adults. Yeah. Um, but there we go. Uh, yeah, and I've, I've found that for me that works particularly well. Um, we have a set grading date every year and it's up to the student to come to me. We usually do it just before mid-December. So they know we have one date a year. They know when it's coming up and they can tell me if they want to go for the grade or not and that's it. And they've had a year to work on it so they could be ready if they put the time in. But likewise, it means if somebody comes along training once every two, well, once every six weeks, then ask to sit their grading, they can sit their grading. I'll tell them they shouldn't. They can still sit it. They're going to fail it. Then they have to deal with that. And then they have to have a look at themselves and think, right, you know, as a responsible adult, as a martial artist, what do I need to do to reach this next level? And, you know, uh, we've got quite a lot of grades in our syllabus. It's based on the old karate grades that we had. So we've got about 10 Q grades and it's broken down into nice little slices for everyone to just build up their knowledge base, build up their understanding, work on their sword staff body relationship as they go you know work on all the blending techniques the awase movements work on the kumitachi as they go tiny little chunks as they go nothing overwhelming there's no huge jump between green belt and brown belt you know blue being this massive syllabus or anything like that and giving them that responsibility giving them that capability to you know take on board their own learning and their own development i think that works really well uh, and it also makes me very unpopular at times. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it would be easier if I just said to them, right, it's time for your grading, come on, let's go. Yep. Uh, but the fact that they think they're ready, then they find they're not, means that I've lost students over that in the past, mm -hmm. um, simply because they disagree with what I think of their ability. But as I say, I'm, I'm not in this, I don't do this to make money. This is not a profession for me. I, I have a job, full-time job. This is, I do this because I love it. Yep. And I want to see that standard maintained throughout. Particularly with the little story I mentioned earlier, I've seen the damage it can cause a dojo and a martial art when you start pandering to the demand for students to control their grading environment. Well, you know, I think I think the, the pandering to the students, and you could use the word just trying to, I guess, appeal, 
uh, I'm reminded of the story of, of Koichi Tohei, where I guess in the late uh, 60s, he, uh, here in America, I guess, came upon people that were fascinated with the demonstrations he was doing, but not from a martial arts standpoint. They liked the key development. Mm -hmm. And they were intrigued. They're like, we want to see more of this. So I think he experienced the upward pressure from, you know, these prospective students that said, you know, we, we're, we want to see more of this. And, and presumably they were willing to either have him back and pay him to do a demonstration or become his students. And I think that that's where he started on the branch off, away from Aikido as a martial art into Aikido mm -hmm. as like a key development art that had little to do with self-defense or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not because he wasn't capable. It's just he had a, a an audience demand that that had their wallet out, and he was willing to say, "All right, well, if you know this is a what you pay me to do, and b, I think it's probably where his interest was anyway. I think that you know he did Aikido long enough, and he found an aspect to it that he really loved, and that was the key development stuff, mm -hmm. and he just really filled yeah. his time mostly with that." And I, I'm, not, I'm not judging him that way because yeah. it can happen. Um, there's a, a man by the name of Ido Portal, and he does a lot about the movement culture thing, but he came from Capoeira. He was a martial artist. He loved the athleticism and the movements. He just didn't really care about the martial art part. So he just took the movement hmm. part and made like fitness videos. And, and he became a, like a world expert in how to improve your fluidity, your balance, your hand-eye coordination, all these things. And he wound up actually training, uh, helping train uh, Conor McGregor uh, when he was, mm -hmm. when he was fighting. So, and very effective at it, but hyper-specialized and, you know, mm -hmm. found a way to go different than, than the martial art background that he had. And I kind of wonder if Aikido is taking a similar um, divergence from where it was decades ago into something completely different. Um, mm -hmm. and I, and I, and I say that primarily because of the, where the Aikikai seems to be directed and the overall culture generally of Aikido, I I'm really glad to see that there are people like you and I who are still interested in the, the martial heritage and the effectiveness of Aikido as a self-defense or self-protection art. Uh, and it's, we're going to keep it alive. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. I don't think it should be a war between factions within the aikido world it's just it's going to be different any more than you know if i want to learn painting and i go to two different painters and they both paint very differently i can still learn from both of them and my mm -hmm. style will probably be different from both of those as well yeah yeah Ab absolutely it's uh, i've i've always tried to have that i've i've never trained traditional aikikai purposefully because uh perhaps it's just me Perhaps it's just how I choose to live my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't need justification from someone to tell me if what I do is good. Mm -hmm. I can tell by what I do and how I do it and how much research I put into it, how much I reverse engineer the techniques that I teach to know that what I'm doing, here's the basis for it, here's the foundation for it, this is how it works. And I don't know if that comes from having studied a martial art prior to start Naikido, in, you, you know, one with a foundation based in fighting, which was karate and judo. Uh, but at the same time, I've, I've never had this desire to be approved by the Aikikai. I've never sought out to be approved by the Aikikai. I don't have a dislike for the Aikikai. Uh, I try to keep them at an extreme arm's length as much as possible. Uh, I see it more as a... Well, I'm doing, I'm doing things as a political organization I, I see it as a martial political organization that's just there to um and a money-making organization i'm just going to come out and say it uh I, I don't see the purpose of people who genuinely train hard and are dedicated to the art that they study having to answer or pander i'll use that word again pander to the aikikai just for recognition Mm -hmm. uh, particularly given how much money they want for it, which I completely disrespect. I've, I've got no, res I don't disrespect them. I have no respect for the amount of money it costs just to lodge a downgrade, just to have a stamp on a piece of paper. Sure. I think it's disgusting. I'll well, be honest. I, I I'm think just going that, to that is that. A, the marketing power of the Weishaba family name is that's their mm -hmm. claim. They're like the McDonald's. We have our logo or, or Disney. We've got the, the mouse. 
you know, that's our intellectual property and we're going to claim ownership. And, and if you want to play, play in our park, you're going to pay the admission and, and it's going to be, you know, you're going to keep kind of keep us going. And, and that's why I wanted, I, I did think that the, the title of this episode of the, the marketing problem is, is pretty accurate because that is how the open perception is among, among people. It's like, well, this is more high worship as art. And therefore, since he's passed, it's now belongs to his family and, and et cetera. When in fact, you and I know that a martial art, just like teaching somebody to paint, the, you teach a student to paint their, their own painter. Now they're not doing what you t- showed them. They're learning and doing their own art. That's, that's yeah. I guess why it would not be called a martial science. It'd be called a martial art. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we all have our own interpretations of it and, and there's really no way to claim ownership. Uh, once you teach somebody something, it belongs to them. Uh, and what they yes. do with it is, you know, uh, has, has a has life of its own. Yeah, yeah. It's even on a basic level in the dojo. That's something I tell my students every day is that when you see a technique being done, don't imitate what I do because you're a different size, you're a different shape, you're a different gender, different life attitude, different thought process. You have to look at what's being taught absorb it, assimilate it, and make it work for your individual body and demeanor. And the same goes for Aikido across the board. Is uh, I think even O-Sense even said something like that. You, you know, when, when you read through all the numerous books that have hundreds of quotations, mm-hmm. most of which they probably never said. But, yep. um, you, you know, even made a, he's even quoted as making a statement like, it, it doesn't show techniques, you have to take them from them. That's what I see as that, is, is that it's it's not about stealing techniques from them. It's about looking at how something's done and then reinterpreting it for your benefit, for what you need. And that's one of the best things about Aikido is it doesn't have, or it doesn't work at its best when it has fixed forms, fixed mm-hmm. stances, fixed attitudes. It's a free-flowing, creative expression of movement into martial that's how I see Aikido. And that's what I try and teach everyone I come into contact with. You know, don't copy me because it, it's not going to work for you that way. You have mm-hmm. to make it work for yourself. And for me, that's the fundamental aspect of Aikido. So for to get back on track with what, what we're talking about here before I go off and I to pull my underpants over my trousers and become tangent man, <laughs> um, <laughs> we can... Uh, when we look at the Aikikai and when I look at what the Aikikai demand, what they're demanding is what their interpretation of what the founder of Aikido through the expression of his family thinks that should be. Mm. Now, I don't necessarily think, I could probably stand up in front of an Aikikai grading panel and even after 30 years, they probably wouldn't recognise 40% of what I do. So where would that leave me? You know, and it's, that doesn't mean that, I, that what I do is wrong. It just means it's different. Mm-hmm. And if there's one thing Aikido should teach us, is that the differences we have are our strengths, not our weaknesses. Right. And rather than being expunged from the Aikikai family, you know, and not being allowed to hold up a piece of paper with a stamp on it, saying, the Ueshibas love me. Um, <laughs> what actually happens is... That, that kind of attitude puts people off and that's the kind of political side of the so-called way of harmony the way of harmony is more fractious than I was going to say the Middle East and it's not far wrong it's right. just it's you know it's, it's, that's maybe horribly topical and I apologise but um, it's there's more subdivision politics fractiousness in Aikido than any other martial art I can think of Mm. Uh, particularly in Britain, particularly in the UK, it's really, really, really bad uh, from a personal standpoint. Sure. You, you, you know, there's so many different associations, so many different things, so many different attitudes, so many different clubs, so many different styles. But that's what it has to be. That's what the martial art was developed as. And no matter who trained with the founder, when they trained with them, they would have been shown something different. Sure. So to then cover it all with the blanket of Aikido, Mm-hmm. also seems very strange because what O-Sense was teaching in the late 30s was very different from what he was teaching in the 50s. Mm. It was two completely different things. So the only way, the only reason people are walking away with the term Aikido is because it was trained under 
with Ueshiba. Mm-hmm. Whereas what you'll probably find is back in the 30s, what they were getting was more Aike Ueshiba Ha, Aike Bajutsu. Mm-hmm. And what they were getting post Second World War was probably more Aike Do, as in the formation of something that's softer falls below the radar of a martial art to be avoided and banned by the occupying forces and something that, that, that's acceptable as a, a body art and a, a self-development tool. So you've, you've got this whole, you've, you've almost got two polarised extremes with all the little segments in between. And that's a kind of, um, that's just an aspect to the, how, what Aikido is and how that martial art works. Sure. You know, as, as I was thinking about this too, I, I was thinking back to the how uh, Morahai Ueshiba took on martial arts training because the era was entirely different. He would travel around. He'd find anybody with experience, as, as far as I understood. He crossed their path. He would want to train with them, want to learn with them. Uh, this was an, an era where uh, challenging other martial artists to an actual fight was commonplace. Uh, I don't know if, if he ever challenged anybody, but as he grew to have more renown, people did come to him and challenge him. And he accepted these challenges. And to me, that was his marketing, really. I don't think he really had a, a, a goal of, I want to put together, you know, create my own organization or my own student base or my own school or anything. I think he just pursued his art, impressed people. They were drawn to him and it kind of naturally organically grew into a more formal structure as time went on. Um, and you look at today, imagine somebody trying to do that. Like they basically would just visit dojos, train with people, impress them. And then what, you know, expect to be challenged and then, you know, Mm -hmm. walk away impressing somebody so much with getting beat in a challenge that they want to become your, your student and they want to follow you. Like, I suppose that would be possible, but I would imagine that any dojo that would have somebody like that come into it would probably throw them out. Just say, you know what, if you're in here to, challenge my students, challenge me, or to try to uh, poach students out of my school, then you're not welcome here, get out. And, and mm-hmm. there's, so the marketing success that he had was kind of built to his time and his era and the thing that the, the culture that was there, which is completely different than it is now. And so, you know, uh, I think that if there was one thing in common, and that is be an extremely competent martial artist. If you're going to be an instructor or going to be a senior martial artist, you're going to represent your art, do it really well. That's what you have in common with the Morahai uh, in, in, in his, yeah, in his prime. Absolutely. But the other part, we don't, the other parts we don't have, but I think that, that where we find the success, or at least where I've found it is having students that take their Aikido into the real world and have success with it. Like those people love, Aikido and they, they love coming back and they love learning because they can, they can enjoy the successes of seeing it work and function in the environment it's supposed to function in. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I have a I have students, number of students that have come back to me with stories about how they've had to use Aikido and not just that they had to throw somebody down really hard, but they've used very soft and subtle ways to manipulate a situation to come out peaceful for everybody and nobody got hurt. Um, you know, creatively, because that's mm-hmm. kind of what, what I, th- I think Aikido has within it is not just really super effective, powerful technique, but also the developing the mind to find creative solutions that do not involve having to, you know, fold somebody up, you know, inside their clothes um, mm-hmm. or, or hurt them to stop them. Um, and I think those success stories are, are what and I wanted to cover this in the show, not to just pose that we have, you know, this incredible marketing problem, but to say, I think there is a way forward that's going to be productive. And that's going to be through creating our own success stories with our students and with our, our own training. And, and I don't want to address this merely to instructors to say uh, how their, what their focus should be with their students. Like, what if you are a student, you know, and you're, you're learning Aikido your passion and what you want from your Aikido is something your instructor should be responding to and giving that to you. And if they can't, you need to either get them to start doing it or find an instructor that will do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we all have control. Even if you're just started within six months of Aikido, you have an incredible amount of influence over what you get out of the art. And and this is something that I think uh, a lot of people 
have perhaps they don't realize it. And that is that you as a student can exceed your instructor in their ability. Mm-hmm. You can go beyond where they teach you. And not just by, beca- by finding a better instructor and going and learning from them. I'm talking about the, the, what you demand of yourself in your own training and in classes can build a, a better technical base than the person instructing you has. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, I know that the Japanese and, and the Eastern Asian cultures are very strict on the, you know, you, they have such a reverence for their instructor that they would never want to, to exceed them. But I have heard it as a, a Japanese saying that a good student will surpass the, the, the teacher and they, yeah. and, and they should, it's just, I don't see it happen very often. Um, you know, uh, but to be a really good student, you should strive to be as good, if not better than the person teaching you. Um, yes. And, yeah. And it will take Absolutely. time, but it, you can do it. Yeah. And uh, a, a good instructor will, as you said, will, will strive to make the student better than he actually, or she actually is. They mm-hmm. actually are because it's that for, for, for me, that's the goal of an instructor is to mm-hmm. give your knowledge over to someone, give everything you've learned all your experience over to someone else and allow them to add their experience to it, add their particular mindset, their particular take on things. Mm -hmm. And that allows them to become something greater, something more than you do. And And, both. It is a wonderful experience to see a student flourish to that level where they are on par with you. And then, then, and this is, I guess a lot of people would probably, a lot of instructors would probably find this intimidating that day when you learn something from your student that they teach you Mm -hmm. something you find that they learned that they did not get from you and they are now giving it to you. To me, that's a wonderful experience. Absolutely. Um, It's, but I can see where, where it would be easy to think that that is a damage to your own ego and to your own self Mm -hmm. esteem to say, well, this is the person I taught and now they're teaching me. Mm -hmm. Well, I think to put that in perspective, first we have to realize we're all getting older. If you're teaching mm-hmm. a younger person and they, they can exceed your performance, if nothing else, but by age, but, yeah. but I, to me, it's, there is a, a very distinct brotherhood of people that have gone through what it takes to get to that high level of excellence. And it, it's irrelevant as to which of us are better than the other. If we all have a certain high level of skill and ability, we have, there's a mutual respect there. And that's something I think to be cherished, not to, not to have it look uh, looked upon as, okay, well, are you better than me or am I better than you? Or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, to me, that stuff is uh, that's if there was a criticism of the, why there should not be competition in Aikido, it is that mindset that should not be there. Um, mm-hmm. I think a, a better attitude is to say, with somebody of your experience, I'm certain that you have something to teach me. And I can say that about somebody who's studied Aikido for half the time that I have. I'm mm-hmm. certain that they've learned something that I didn't, and I will try to find it. I'll try to, I, I, that's what I want to try to s- discover and, and steal from them. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's just a maturity of character more than anything else. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. When definitely. I, whenever I've encountered high, very high level martial, martial artists and competitors, the one, most of them have that attitude of, you know, I certainly don't know everything there is to know. And I'm, I, I'll, I'm here to learn because I love learning even more. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's one of the things that we should be striving to do as martial artists is to not, you hear people say, to talk about destroying your ego and mm-hmm. all, all that. It's, it's not, it's about coming to terms with the fact that, that you, like everyone else around about, is a human being that you will have your limitations but and to look at the fact that those limitations may only be temporary and respect that there is going to come a time when physically you're going to be more limited perhaps mentally you may become more limited but at the same time you can still be open to learning and advancement through the education of those that you yourself have trained up and I've experienced that myself it, it, it can feel difficult, particularly, I think, particularly when you don't have the experience to understand that you're not being challenged. You're actually being complimented when a student starts, when you start to learn from your students, that's one of the biggest compliments you can actually get. Mm-hmm. 
because it also shows a level of maturity with yourself. It shows that your student understands you as an individual, as a person, and that they respect you enough to be able to hope that you are not going to take this in a negative way. And it shows that you've got a great bond there rather than this, you know, I was, I was at this course and I saw this thing and, you know, I think he would like to see this, but I'm, I don't want to show him it in case he, you know, he thinks I'm trying to take over. Or he, you know, I, I would hope that attitude never comes into any of my students or my dojo because for me, it's just as important to keep that learning. Learning's a two-way street. And you will, you don't know everything. You can never know everything, you know. And at some point, somebody is going to come up and show you something. And that's where the terms, I, I quite like the term sensei and its traditional aspect of effectively someone who has knowledge or someone who has experience that you don't, someone who has been there before mm-hmm. you have i.e. someone who's opened a specific door and gone through it with specific knowledge that they can then transfer to you. Mm -hmm. And there's no shame in that relationship switching momentarily or permanently if you chose to do that, whereby you could learn from your own students and then in turn become more yourself. And through your own experience and insight that you have gained from the martial arts, Look at what your student is teaching you and you might find you break that information down and reassimilate it differently so that you can actually point out something else to them further down the line. Mm. And therefore that cycle of knowledge keeps going. And that's a wonderful thing. But that's, that, that continuous learning would stop if you just refused to learn from something your student knew that you didn't. Well, and, and I, I've found too that and this has been with many mentors that I have had that you never get to the point where you've completely tapped them dry. You learned everything that they, all the Mm -hmm. wisdom that they have to share. Like I've found that there's great value in keeping people that are wise, insightful in my circle of friends because they were always learning. They will always have something that I have not, heard from them yet or learned from them yet or even just new ideas because we're all growing together so it's not like there's a a finite amount of water in a a certain cup and then once you drink it all you're done and now you got to go somewhere else i mean sometimes you do sometimes you do need to find a new mentor but Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you need to abandon or leave somebody that is still providing you insights that help you grow um and i think that that that's good that's something too that that feeds into just your constant life growth, you know, where you, you have, have somebody that's been nourishing to your intellectual growth or your physical growth or, you know, Mm -hmm. your, your martial experience uh, to, to keep people like that around. And, you know, we see so many influences that are just a complete waste of time uh, that are, that will drain your, your spirit. They don't mm-hmm. nourish, nourish your spirit at all. And that's to me where I see the great value in a good instructor because what they will bring out in a student is, is just so amazing, uh, you know, given that chance to have that relationship with, with uh, you know, mentor to student. Um, one of the things, you know, that I wanted to, to cover, and this may be jumping track a little bit, but, uh, and that is Aikido's identity crisis of, exactly what is it? And, and this, I think is something that does contribute to the marketing slash image, the marketing problem in terms of an image. Um, you know, when you ask 10 different Aikido practitioners, what Aikido is, you get about 15 different answers. Um, and I think it's okay that there is not one ubiquitous answer that covers everybody. And it's not that the answer needs to be the same. It's just, there has to be a clear answer. And I think mm-hmm. this is, if there was one thing that I think would help the Aikido image the most is just some clarity. Like what exactly is it supposed to be? What is the benefit going to, going to have? Because any business will tell you if you're not clear what your product is, or you're not clear mm-hmm. what your service is, or what you're clear, what the benefit to the, your customer is, mm-hmm. you won't get any customers. They will be confused. They won't even know what to expect. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's our duty as those representatives of the art to at least be clear of what we're, we're trying to do and what we are, the benefits we're going to bring 
people for coming to us to learn. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that that's something that the Aikido world or even a single organization can necessarily message because, you know, an organization, say, has a dozen dojos in it. Each of those dojos is a little bit different in what they exactly want to offer. Uh, but I think a, a strong message is, is definitely would be very useful for the image part of, of Aikido. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I'm just thinking here, perhaps this is why Aikido is still proving popular in Japan. Mm -hmm. Because the people, the Japanese, their, their cultural heritage and mindset naturally understands what it is they're getting without perhaps them having to be told what they're getting. Sure. Whereas in the West, as you say, we want, we want the name, the title and the tagline with the trailer. Mm -hmm. of what we're actually going to be receiving. Sure. And if, as you say, again, if we get that wrong, if you look at what we are producing here as a business, without that business plan and that identity, it's very difficult for people to understand what they're coming into. And I think that's a great analogy you've just hit on because it, it literally highlights why it's so easy to discredit and to deride what a lot of people in Aikido are doing because it, it does give off so many mixed messages, so many mixed signals. And invariably, a lot of people who, I'm going to go out on a limb here, a, a lot of people who also teach Aikido are not actually aware of what they're teaching mm -hmm. in terms of what their, their end product for their students is supposed to be. They're just reiterating the training that they've been given. And I'm not saying they don't love it. I'm not saying that they're not passionate about it, but unless they challenge it and unless they, they have that strategy to make it something that they themselves understand completely and can then direct, it, again, it becomes diffused, lacking focus, and mm -hmm. therefore even more confusing to people when they want to see what it is. Uh, I mean, from my perspective, when, whenever people ask me what Aikido is, and it's a very vague answer, but it's it's possibly the, the most true answer I can give them. I just tell them it's it's what they make it, quite literally. Aikido is what you make it. So you have to have that focus behind you. And I think that that's coming from the same angle as yourself here. You have to have that same focus. So I, I can have students who want their Aikido experience to be a social experience. They want to come along, meet people, make friends. That's fine. That's what they do. And you tend to find they will gravitate towards other people who want that within the class. But they'll also train with some of the harder course students. But they'll, I encourage that kind of communication. You have to let the, hard, the, the hardcore guys know, I don't want to get thrown about like an idiot here. I'd, I'd rather just train technically and have some fun with it. And then you get the ones coming in who want to learn self-defence. So... They, they have to adapt their training to that and I have to adapt my style of instruction to that to make sure that they're adequately covered for what they're looking for. So what tends to happen in one of my classes is after about a couple of weeks, I start to know what people want. So I'll go to one pair and I'll show them something and then I'll build on what I, show, uh, I, I was demonstrating and then I'll go to the next one and I'll show them something and then while nobody's looking, I'll say, right, while you're at it, this is... This is how you cause some serious damage with this technique. You do this, you do that, but don't tell anybody else I just showed you that because they're not interested. And it tends to mean that I kind of run about like a, like a headless chicken at times. But uh, it means that I'm, I know what my students are looking for, therefore I can help bring that out in them in their training. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it has really fun consequences. Um, you have the ones who are who come to it because they think it's for some sort of, um, and this is very loose, um, you get the ones coming to it who think it's it, 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 it's a spiritual art and it can be mm -hmm. but anything can be spiritual drinking a cup of tea can be spiritual mm -hmm. you know, going to the toilet can be spiritual I suppose <laughs> <laughs> after a curry, it probably feels like one but yeah. um, <laughs> at the same time anything we do can have a spiritual context if it means something to us as individuals mm -hmm. uh, and it's fun to watch them training with the guys who are a bit more hardcore because eventually you see two sides of the equation coming to an agreement somewhere in the middle and both what they do 
someone who's looking for just a little bit of enlightenment into the life through hitting the ground and getting back up again. You know, why am I doing this? Hitting the ground, getting back up. Why am I doing this every single time? People who don't know what they're there for, they're just looking for something against some of the guys who are a bit more hardcore. They then start asking themselves the question, why is this person content to hit the ground and get up all the time? And they start to learn, you know, why are they just not giving up? Why aren't they staying down? Why am I constantly getting thrown? Why is this guy challenging me so much? And you start to see these little microcosms of society happen within the dojo. And that's something I love to watch, where mm -hmm. people start to learn from each other through the expression of Aikido without actually having to speak it. Mm -hmm. And that the way we treat each other in the dojo and the way we train with each other in the dojo tells us a lot about how we as individuals need to develop our own lives. And that's why I always say to people, it's, it's what you put into it, it's what you're going to get out of it. And when they ask me, you know, exactly what it is, I try not to tell them it's a martial art. I try not to mention certain movie actors. I try not to mention anything that gives people a predisposed idea. And I plead with them, please do not go on YouTube. And Because af after the first lesson, most people are really buzzing. And they're like, that was great. I want to learn more. I'm like, right, stay off YouTube. Do not go near YouTube. <laughs> is it, can, see that technique you did? Is it on YouTube? <laughs> sort of on YouTube. What do you mean? You'll see things like that on YouTube, but it's not going to be how I do it. It's not going to be how you're going to learn it. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there somewhere I can find this? Yes. Next week, come back. We'll do it again. And we keep the process going. Uh, because how I've developed in my particular way of doing things, my particular style of Aikido is different from what they see online. And that's just the bottom line of it. It's different from what theirs is going to be as well. Uh, when they develop, they absorb, they assimilate, they make it theirs, mm -hmm. they change it, and they make it work for them. Uh, so, yeah, I always find it's a very difficult question, you know, when people come in, uh, what is Aikido? It's, I mean, ultimately, it's, it's one of the few martial arts that covers a whole range of different subjects. And, but again, that's its biggest problem. Yeah, when, when new students come in, I will usually ask them, what, what about uh, Aikido appealed to you or what, what drew mm -hmm. you to your, your interest? Because that answer can be very different. Um, and of course, as an instructor, I want to try to get them what it is they're looking for. And I don't have any two students that are there for the exact same yeah. reason. They, they all have a certain way of how, what, how they want to grow with it. Um, and so... You know, I think we've talked a little bit about some of the, the disadvantages, the unclear messaging or the, the vague mission statement or, or lack of one uh, is a problem. I wanted to kind of end this on what are some of the advantages that, that Aikido has, because I think these often get overlooked um, in terms of what, what Aikido offers that a lot of other martial arts don't. And you actually hit on a word that I had to write down because this is, applies so well, and that is accessibility. Um, it, it is a grappling art that, and it's, it's not easy to find grappling arts accessible to adult students. Uh, mm -hmm. And for those I count, you know, wrestling, uh, yes, jujitsu is pretty uh, accessible generally, but I don't know how it is in the UK, but at least here in the States, there are quite a few jujitsu gyms around, but a lot of them appeal to the 20 something or the, you know, young men that want to go in and, and go hard. And mm -hmm. I've heard from a number of students that are, you know, more mature age, uh, older that just say, you know, I'm just not up for having my shoulder ripped out and, and on a regular basis. Like I can't, I can't handle that level of intensity. Now that's not all jujitsu gyms, but there is a lot more accessible to people in, at least here in the United States that are in school, they can go through a wrestling program. They can go through physically intensive, uh, type of a type of a school but you know if you're an adult after high school and maybe college you just don't have access to learning wrestling or whether it's catch mm -hmm. wrestling or competitive wrestling like that window is closed and you just don't don't even have access to it but uh i do think that that aikido i like uh, personally i like and i think this is an advantage how it deals with a confrontation that starts standing up it's, it starts it from many different angles. Uh, it deals with quite a few different attacks. I, I'm a little frustrated that, that a lot of contemporary Aikido tends to treat all strikes as either Shomenuchi or Yokomenuchi for the most part, and which mm -hmm. frustrates me. But don't forget they tell you it's coming. Right, yeah, the wave the hand and, and then go, yep. Um, 
you know, you're looking for the wrong body signals. So I've had to re- readjust that, but you know, it, I think it is overall a pretty versatile art. I like how the movement, and I've been going through my students with this once again, just recently about dealing with kicks. Cause I've been asked a number of times like, Oh, you know, how do we like to deal, deal with kicks? It's like pretty simply just keep moving. If you keep moving around and you mm-hmm. see somebody load a hip and you move they're on one foot, it's hard to readjust mm-hmm. that kick. So, um, you know, but, and this is where I think an art that deals with standing and then taking somebody to the ground is a very effective real world approach. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm more fond of the, the throws and the drops and the, and the stuff where you get okay on the ground than the joint locks. Although mm-hmm. I like joint locks a lot too. I just think they kind of take second to setting somebody on the ground or mm-hmm. letting gravity do, do the work. Um, i.e. hitting them with the planet. Um, <laughs> That, that to me is, you know, when you have to hit somebody, that's a good way to do it. You know, I'd rather save my knuckles and let the planet do, do the work. Yeah, do the um, work. Yeah. So, and those I think are advantages because gravity as an ally is a tremendous ally. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I do like the angle basically that, or the, I should say the, the real estate that Aikido has carved out of using uh, movement angles, but to get in to control somebody's body or influence it to take their posture and get them to the ground. I think judo is fantastic, uh, you know, as an art, I, I wish it had, was a little more uh, open in terms of dealing with attacks from all different angles and not mm-hmm. just straight on, you know, that tends to be more of a, of a sport kind of a thing, but, but it, I mean, no, but no art does hip throws better than, than judo. I mean, hands no, down, no, not, not even. Yeah. Close. Um, and I view that Aikido, Judo, uh, Karate, and even Sumo are very similar arts in many respects, uh, <laughs> more than more than would would be to meet the eye as meets the eye. But uh, what are some of the other advantages that you would see? I think, and I think this is where clarifying the message message on what our advantages are is the way forward, rather than just saying, "Well, we're gonna," you know. We got, we got to get on the same page. Well, that's kind of vague, you know, but, Mm -hmm. and to choose the, any particular dojo or instructor chooses the advantages they feel are important to them. They don't all need to be identical. Um, But as long as they're there, when somebody says, well, what is Aikido about? What am I going to get by studying there? Here they are. Here's the advantages. Mm. Thoughts? Yeah. For me, the, the first one, Aikido's biggest advantage is, that when practiced properly, and this this one's a little esoteric, but again, it's something I tell everyone. Uh, when practiced properly, Aikido is unique because it doesn't change you to suit the art. It mm. changes itself to suit you. Mm. And in order to do that, yes, you're going to have to understand basics. Yes, you're going to have to understand postures. Yes, you're going to have to understand movements. But those postures are not going to be fixed. Mm. Uh, I've studied or I've trained with, studied maybe too strong a word. I've, I've, I've trained, well, I studied karate for 16 years. I did judo for about four years, five years when I was younger. And I've also studied with guys who do some forms of Kung Fu, some Wing Chun, uh, Hung Gar, Lao Gar, all this type of thing. And a lot of these have very fixed, and some karate styles as well, Shotokan, for example, have very fixed stance postures. And they, it's almost like they want to change you to suit the art rather mm-hmm. than finding where you fit into the art with your particular thing. Aikido has styles, but for me, and I don't mean this in a silly way, it has no style once you start practicing it properly. It has styles of application, but it has no style once you start taking the art on board. And I think that's a very important thing. Its other greatest strengths are that it's it, it's usable by, again, once you start to understand the basics, it can be used by anyone. It don't, you don't have to be extremely fit. You don't have to be super flexible. You don't have to be strong. You don't have to, you're not favoured by having a specific gender for specific roles within the, the art itself. It's, uh, and that's where that applicability comes in. You can have someone come into your dojo who has mobility issues 
uh, problems with their knees, problems with their hips, and you can still teach them some Aikido. That would be prohibited movement in other martial arts because you couldn't adopt these rigid postures that you would need to get into. They can still learn some Aikido. Mm-hmm. What I love about Aikido as well, another strength is, again, when you practice it on a, and when you break it down and look at the various weapons movements and everything that we do, when you start to combine your weapons movement into your unarmed techniques, which is something that, from my personal opinion, a lot of styles within the Aikido community don't do. They practice their weapons differently. Their postures and weapon training is different from their postures in Taijutsu and their body movement. Mm-hmm. I don't train that way. All my postures remain the same. And I've worked on that or something I've worked on over the past 15 years to create a system the way I teach it, that when you're training unarmed using Bokken or Joe, the movements you're doing, for example, Ski, Gaydan, Gaish, is actually Ikkyo. You're practicing Ikkyo from a shoulder grab, you know, and things like that. And your body movement with the jaw reflects exactly how your body movement is when you're unarmed. So you can practice on your own. You go away and you practice all your jaw movements, practice your bucking movements, and what you're actually doing is practicing your partnership movements. And when you have the system integrated like that, it can be a great thing. That's an amazing strength for a martial art to go away. And even though you have no fixed form, what you're actually training is the principal solid foundations of all your techniques. There's very few martial arts have that, that kind of symbiosis strongly between weapons and body movement. And I think that's one of Aikido's greatest strengths as well. Uh, what I also think is really important and what's missing and what, people, what a lot of people miss is a lot of people look at the throws and the techniques and they think it, that'll never work if you had to use that, which is not necessarily untrue. A lot of the throws and techniques in Aikido won't work in any given situation. But then again, most of the techniques and strikes, punches, grapples, takedowns in any martial art will not work in a given situation as well. It's just Aikido makes bigger movements, demonstrative stuff, so it's easier to tear it apart with thinking that's not how a human body reacts when you do this to it. However, the principles forming the foundation of those techniques can be applied. You know, Tai Sabaki, my eye, keeping distance, keeping movement, understanding, you know, taking proper zanshin, being aware of your surroundings, all of this stuff which is very basic belt and braces movements in Aikido, how to stand, how to adjust your posture, how to bring your center down, how to control your body movement, how to control your body weight. All of these things can make a tremendous amount of difference in any form of applied function. And it's one of the hidden strengths in Aikido is that we learn how to use our bodies more efficiently to undertake the movements and the techniques that we're trying to do. Now, this can be brought to bear in even basic mundane things, you know, like like pushing a trolley. (laughs) You know, if you drop your centre and get into your hips and get into your thighs and use your calves properly and get your body in a nice, strong forward momentum position, even something like, you know, pushing a laden trolley becomes easier Mm -hmm. because you're biomechanically using your body in a much more efficient fashion. a much more efficient way using more efficient biomechanical factors. And that's something that, again, Aikido can give us. So when you no, translate that's, that's, that. You're, you just hit, I think, on the best uh, definition of key development that I've heard. That's yet. exactly what I call key. Yeah. It's biomechanics. It's mm-hmm. focus intent, focused intent with proper attitude with biomechanics. That's mm-hmm. what key is. It's when your mind and your body are functioning on the same level, at the same point, doing the right thing exactly as it's needed in the exact moment, you know, and you're not, your spirit's behind it. You're not shying away from it. Mm-hmm. You, you, you know, that's, that's what happens. Um, you know, you can put a ladder up the side of a building and you can ask me to go up there and fix the roof and I'm forward projected. My body's behind it. I've got the proper attitude. I get to the top and my spirit falters and I look down and all of a sudden I can't move, <laughs> you know, and it's like, ah, I'm going to die up here. 
You know, right. as long as your body, mind, and spirit are functioning on the same level, doing the same thing, that's your key. That's key movement. That's what it's all about. You know, sure. everything working together for a final goal. I'm fine to get to the top. I'm, and then that's it. It's like, you know, I would say the red arrows, but it's a slightly different colour. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's what all that's about. So all, all, all that fundamental stuff, that's the strengths in Aikido. And that's one of its biggest benefits. It's the things you can't see that you get from Aikido. That's what the general public, the ones that are out there deriding it, looking at it as rubbish. This is not going to work. This is not going to be effective on the street. Once you learn, for example, to drop your body weight and extend weight underside and I'm what, 17 stone? If I can get 17 stone coming through my palm as I move a nudge against someone who's trying to be aggressive towards me, I hit that in the sternum. They're going to know about it. It, it doesn't have to do a lot of damage. You get it under the chin, they're really going to know about it. You know, you get that focused intent that I've learned from doing walking work all these years. You know, I knew those shomenuchis would come in useful sometime, mm -hmm. uh, but that's what it is. It's, it's all about focus and intent, and it's the hidden strengths that people don't see. And that's one of the things that I feel quite sad about when I see people deriding Aikido. They look at techniques being done by someone who clearly has not been doing this for a tremendous amount of time, and sometimes the the level of self-control that comes from the technique isn't there. And that brings me on to my last one. Mm -hmm. Aikido provides us with self-control. And I'm not talking about, you know, I'm, I'm not going to eat chocolate. I'm going to keep off alcohol. You know, we'll stop smoking. Mm -hmm. This is all self-control. I'm going to sit in a cushion and I'm going to meditate for six hours a day because that's the, that's the secret to enlightenment. My Aikido will get better if I do nothing and just sit and stare at a wall. <laughs> I'm not talking about that kind of preconceived notion of self-control that a lot of people seem to get wrong. Aikido works by teaching us to control our own bodies. You cannot control your partner until you can control yourself. If you fail to control yourself, you cannot extend that out into another person. And that's one of the fundamental things I teach all my students from day one. You're not learning to throw that individual in front of you. You are learning to control your body and to put it into motion in a specific way with a specific focus and intent that will result in that person falling over. And we're basically going to hit them, as you said, hit them with the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tend to do a bad James Brown at that point and scream gravity. But um, <laughs> I'm not going to do it just now. Nobody deserves to hear that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's all about if you cannot get your body under control to extend that through to the person that you're working with, if you fail in controlling you, and in order to do that, you have to understand yourself. You have to know yourself. And that is the last thing that I would say that Aikido brings forward. And again, it's one of the big hidden secrets. And I think it's why a lot of people turn away from Aikido is because it's very difficult to look at yourself and look at where your strengths and your weaknesses lie and come to terms with those and then want to translate that into techniques that will work against someone. Because that takes a lot of work. You know, that takes a tremendous amount of work. And it's a continuous progress, continuous journey to do that with yourself. I mean, I've now got problems with lower spine and hip. I've had to go away and start relearning a lot of the stuff that I've taken for granted over the years. You know, that includes getting up out of a chair uh, sometimes. So it's never mind translating that into the dojo. So in order for me to continue doing Aikido, I've had to stop and look at myself, go back to that and rework it. It makes you look at you and all good martial arts do that. They make you look at yourself, you know, and that's one of the biggest strengths about it. Looking at yourself, understanding yourself, being pleased with what you see, forgiving what you don't like and working to change it. Sure. You know, I, I can think of one other advantage and that is, and I've heard this from other martial artists, even in jujitsu, judo, they say Aikido, practitioners do some of the best falls and have some of the best ukemi flat out of any art. Uh, and I think that that's, I think that that's pretty accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. The ironic part to that to me is as soon as you lay your hand on, on somebody, an Aikidoka who's on the ground already, they tend to be way out of the, out of the, <laughs> the realm that like, they're not comfortable there. 
Um, Both know, yeah. And to me, that's a hole in my own Aikido that I've, I've strived to fill mm-hmm. for the last 10, 12 years. And with my students to say, somebody, you do get down on the ground, somebody gets on top of you, they get a hold of you, you should be able to get to your feet and they cannot stop you. Um, but I, I do think that building a, a good relationship with the ground and to be able to get to the ground and back up safely and quickly is, is an advantage. And I think that, yeah. that Aikido is widely reputed to have some of the best uh, ukemi out there. Um, and I'm not even talking the, the, the really nice demo ukemi. That, that's pretty good too. But uh, the ability to make sure that the ground does not hit you and level, you know, take you out. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah. you know, when we're kids, we love the ground. We do everything on the ground. We're made out of rubber <laughs> and we're bouncing around rolling and stuff. And then we grow up and we get terrified of it because the ground represents pain. Uh, yeah. And we're not far off there, but there's a way to learn to, to manage that. And I th- that, I think, is a tremendous advantage mm-hmm. for Aikido. Well, Akemi is about taking responsibility for your own safety. Mm-hmm. And again, it's a, I'd forgotten about that, actually. actually it would have probably came to me at three o'clock in the morning. Oh, I should have said <laughs> sure. that. I'm glad you brought that up. Damn it. I should have said Akemi. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because it's what I say to my students is that it's rare that you're actually not in contact with the ground. Because even during hip throws, you're in contact with your partner and your partner's in contact with the ground. You know where you are in relation to your partner, in relation to the ground around about you. When you take a kemi, you're actually... A kemi's just like going a walk. Every time we walk, we're controlling a fall. Every time we take a step forward, it's a controlled fall. We've just learned to do it better than when we were toddling and walking into coffee tables. Mm-hmm. Well, mostly. Um, <laughs> I still walk at the coffee tables. But uh, the, 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 the aspect of a chem is actually an art in itself. And I don't mean in the metaphysical and esoteric way about falling down, getting back up, you know, Kendall Jurai, that type of thing, where you, you know, fall down nine times, get up for the tenth. Um, it's, it's about realising that your connection to the earth isn't something to be afraid of. It's, it's where your strength lies. Mm-hmm. And invariably, a good... Someone who has studied and worked hard at Ukemi will also, I think, find themselves not unfamiliar or fearful of coming into contact with the ground, just like you were saying there. You know, your techniques might not be strong once you're down there, but the art of getting there isn't a problem. Mm -hmm. And invariably, what causes injury more than anything else is is it's it's not falling it's the sudden stop at the end what right. Akemi teaches us what Akemi teaches us is I actually had that conversation in my youth's class last week if you fell out of a plane will it kill you and they were like yeah I says no it won't yes it will I says no it won't falling out of the plane won't kill you the stop at the end when you hit the ground that's what's going to kill you you know <laughs> right. and you can see them going oh right yeah yeah, yeah very clever mm. and I, it was just to make them stop and think about you know be aware of what you're expressing and how you say it sure. uh, and lo- you know, listen and read the small print always. Um, so it's it, it, coming into contact with the ground doesn't have to be something to be afraid of. In fact, that's why most of Kemi allow us to come back up onto our feet because we're rolling with the impact. We're getting back up and continuing with it mm-hmm. uh, and trying to kind of make that, that metaphor of Aikido work for us. It's not about slamming into the ground. It's about rolling and continuing your movement, extending your body through the ground and then getting back up. And I, I, we try, I try and bring that to students quite a lot as well. But that, yeah, that is a major point uh, that had completely slipped my mind there. I don't mind admitting that. Uh, Ukemi is one of the biggest strengths in Aikido because there's very few martial arts where you will learn. And I'm not talking about, as you say, the big flowing giant Akemi jumping over four bus-sized humans like Evil Can Evil. I'm talking about the general, you know, how to hit the ground, how to control it, how to disperse that impact and get back up unhurt from something that for other people, it looks like you're doing a magic trick. How, you know, a proper Ura Kota guy should theoretically break the wrist and the hip of the person being thrown then hitting the ground and yet somehow we all get back up from it right it's about learning to disperse and to keep going and to roll with it and to continue to make that movement work for you yeah and i think mindset wise you you learn with ukemi to be comfortable of taking a bad situation protecting yourself from it adapting Mm -hmm. and and turning it back to your advantage 
Yeah, uh, and reading and feeling what's going on. You can't right. get behind an Akemi and you can't get in front of an Akemi. You have mm-hmm. to be in the moment. It's almost like a moving Zen in itself. You have to be in that moment. You know, if you're behind it, it's not good. If right. you're in front of it, that's worse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So, well, very cool. This has been a great conversation. I hope we've covered everything that uh, all of our thoughts, and I'm sure we'll both we'll both have uh, middle of the night light bulbs go on. Of, oh, I forgot. Oh, I hope I not. Could have talked about <laughs> <laughs> and I know we could continue talking for a long, long time, but uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Stephen, and I'll let you wrap yeah, up thanks, with Chris. any final thoughts if you have any. No, or do I? Uh, yes, just just a very small one. <laughs> uh, is, just, just so everyone knows when we're talking, it's almost midnight here. It's been a long day. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yep. It's going to be interesting to see where Aikido is going to go in future, mm-hmm. uh, particularly with regards to how we, as an Aikido community, I, I don't think we can overcome the negative mm-hmm. aspects that people are throwing at the art in itself. But what we can do is, you know, put a candle in the window, basically, through our own actions, through our own thoughts, and through our own uh, deeds that we do in the dojo and what we try and put out into the world, because it's not everyone out there is doing bad Aikido. There are people out there who are trying to preserve the martial aspect of it, the martial side of it. There are people out there who are doing amazing things to develop the physical side of Aikido. There are still some people working along the Tohe line, doing you know kind of like internal body work with it and taking it in that direction. It's important to remember that no one is wrong in these aspects. There's so many facets to that diamond that, that is Aikido. It, it's just, we do have to remember, uh, I can't remember who wrote the statement, it was polishing the mirror and grinding the stone, which is, you know, and sometimes training can be like a, a rough diamond, you, you know, sometimes it has to be buffed down and cut mm-hmm. and then the facets polished to see the shine and the sparkle. And it's the same with the polishing the mirror, grinding the stone. When you get a stone and it's rough, you have to cleanse it and buff it. And then sometimes you just have to rub it down until it starts to shine, until you can see yourself. And it's only by looking at yourself that you can actually see that reflection of where you really are and what you can really give out. And that's what's really important for Aikido is that people stay true to what they are doing and don't, you know, discredit everything else that's going on in it. I have the greatest respect for people who are out there doing, you know, key Aikido, uh, Iwana style Aikido. It's, uh, I'm just trying to think of, uh, you know, even Aikikai, you, you know, I, I, I'm not disrespectful of it. What I don't like is that when they then turn around and say their way is the only way that functions. You know, it's, it's it's important that as this art is developing and growing and where it's going in the future, that we all remain clear about that and that we always say just work to do the best we can with it and keep that light going because when it comes to it, people who do come into your dojo, when they see you being genuine and you putting out there what is good, solid, proper foundational Aikido technique, then they're going to know it's something worth doing. And then they can go away and tell 5, 10, 15, 100 people. And that's where the positivity is going to come. It's it's going to be a long haul, I think, trying to turn around the negativity that Aikido suffered over the years. But uh, with proper focus and intent by guys like yourself, people who are trying to make a difference, then it, it can only have a positive effect. You know, we might not completely overturn everything, but it's going to have a very positive effect. So for all the guys out there doing good Aikido, working hard at it, you know, getting in the dojo, putting the time in, putting the effort in. I, I just want to thank them for keeping this art alive and keeping it as uh, pure and, you know, uh, focused as it is, because without the folk like that, without the people who listen to this kind of thing, without the ones who want to see the art preserved and who want to protect it, then... Without that, we'd all be just be kind of lost and floating about in the darkness. So again, just want to thank everybody for doing that. That's very well said, and I, and I want to echo those those thanks. It's it's not always glorious when you're training and sweating in your your own dojo, and it doesn't feel like you know the the world is kind of a not there. It's not present, but your little corner of it will make a difference when you're doing it right and you're 
putting in the work and that effort will show. So, um, you know, there's a bunch of us out here that are doing the same thing. And I think that that's going to be, I like your candle in the window, uh, analogy of, you know, it's not going to be the only way, you know, I know Sealot went through this back, I think in the eighties mm-hmm. where they got a huge flood of popularity and they got, you know, the, the art itself got watered down, but there were people within it that kept true to its, its, its heritage and its mm-hmm. you know, martial integrity. And, you know, maybe we'll get to a situation where yeah. that'll be, you know, that's what we're dealing with. And, and um, you know, it doesn't need to be a war, but we're going to keep, keep that candle burning. Absolutely. We've got to remember floods happen and flood waters recede. Right. You know, and it's what's left at the end of that. That's, that's what you can rebuild. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. This is another great conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Tristan, it's been a pleasure. Excellent. Well, you have a good night. You too. Thanks. Thank you.